first he was excited about having a little sister and then he went back to his mum's for a week and then came home to us and went, oh, that baby's not my sister because she's not coming out of my mum's belly. You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related, real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to episode 197 of the Nacho Kids Podcast. Getting closer. Getting closer, folks. Getting closer to 200. <laughs> it's like, what's so special about 200? <laughs> Do a podcast. Yeah, it's just a lot of numbers. <laughs> yep. Record a podcast with somebody, edit it, post it, whatever you do to it, and then you will see why 200 is such a big number. <laughs> Every number is a big number. Yes, that is true. All righty. And please bear with us as this is another one that is a Zoom mishap, and you can hear dogs barking in the background, but that's okay. It's just part of life. So last week, I talked about getting scholarships to the Nacho Kids Academy and just a brief description of the Nacho Kids Academy. There are over 20 video courses. There are month-long challenges, one of which is the Nacho Kids Boot Camp Challenge. There is an anonymous community, a private journaling feature, and two Q&A calls a month. Yeah. And over 100 hours of Q&A calls to listen to. Mm-hmm. And nobody screenshots your stuff and puts it out there. <laughs> they can screenshot it all day long, but they don't know who you are. <laughs> That's right. Well, we don't have anybody in that community anyway that would do that. No, they're not. And we've had people join the Academy and say, oh, my gosh, it is night and day versus the Facebook group. Oh, of course. It's even more different than night and day, whatever that would be. It's it's day day <laughs> and, and night night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is definitely a lot different and a lot better. You actually get help there, and you get good advice there, mm-hmm. good nacho advice, yep. and you get to talk to me and David. That's right. That's right. So. If you want to apply for a Sylvia Crack Hour Nacho Kids Academy Scholarship, you will get 30 days free to the Nacho Kids Academy, courtesy of Sylvia Crack Hour. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Sylvia. To apply, go to nachokids.com slash scholarships. Plural. Plural. Scholarships. (laughs) So everybody wants to know, what's the catch? So what's the catch? The catch, or catch as I would say, <laughs> is you have to provide us an anonymous testimonial about the Nacho Kids Academy. And that doesn't mean you have to say how great we are. We want an honest testimonial. Yep. And also, we always ask for feedback on how we can improve the Academy. And... The only thing we've really been told is some people don't like videos. Mm -hmm. They would rather read. And people want an app. Well, the solution to the app issue is you add the shortcut to your home screen on your phone. Boom, yeah. Yeah, because everything already functions like an app. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, just putting a shortcut on your phone makes makes everything function just like an app at that point yep that's the only benefit that you're getting differently um as far as the other one goes mm, we are looking at ways to potentially provide more written content or taking what we have and do written content the downside is that um if it if we send our videos through most services it just comes back with the um, the printed version. So you don't really know who's talking. <laughs> um, I think there are some that will try to differentiate who's talking 
Um, but that's a, it's a different paid service and all that. And it's kind of one of those things where if you have, you know, let's just take a number, you've got 500 people been through the Academy and you've got one or two people that says, I like, I'd prefer reading. Um, well, that's it's not to, financially to, or time beneficial for us to do it. Right. Right. And then if you've got of those, just say 500 people, you've got 200 that says I'd rather have, or I need or want to see something else. Then you kind of see where the priorities fall. And so it's mm-hmm. not, it doesn't mean we won't do it. It just means that of the list of priorities that gets pushed way down. And trust me, we have a long list of priorities <laughs> when yes. it comes to things to do. But that doesn't mean we don't want your feedback because if you give us feedback and it bumps those things up, then you know that's what we're there for. We're there to make it something that is a resource that you will use and benefit from and improve your blend, your life, your sanity, your relationships, all the way around. But here's the thing. If you do put it in writing, text format, Mm-hmm. You can't see when I roll my eyes at David. Yeah, that's true. I would have to go in and put insert eye roll every other line. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't found any AI services that yet do that. Yeah. And well, that's you part just, of the fun. <laughs> but I guess you could just put, you know, in the beginning, just say, uh, eye roll is every other sentence, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> eye roll is every time David talks. <laughs> I kid, I kid. Uh, not really. I, I Yeah. I'm <laughs> so, so, but yeah, for the for those of you who want to join the academy or even just check out the academy, and for whatever reason, you're like, um, I don't want to spend my own dime to do that, or I can't afford to do that, or whatever. It doesn't matter. There's no, there's no reason why you can't apply. The only thing we ask of you is that one, you use it, and two, you give us feedback. And I will be very honest when I say this. We have had people get scholarships, and they will not provide feedback. Mm, Shame, shame. And it bothers me because... Because it's lying, that's why. Well, they agreed to provide that feedback when they applied for the scholarship. Mm -hmm. Now we know why you got family problems. Can't do what you agreed to do. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Well, and the thing is, we're not asking for a novel. I mean, you could put three sentences. I like the academy. I learned a lot. It helped me. Or I think the academy sucks. It's not going to help anybody. Y'all were losers. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Just a testimony. Yep. Testimonial. That's all we ask for. Yep. Yep. So you get a $49 value for a brief testimonial. Yeah. And y'all listen. This is a this is Sylvia Krakauer scholarship. Sylvia, from her own money, paid for this. This is not us giving it away for free. This is not um, some some bartering system we got with Sylvia. She believes in this so much, and she loves the step family community so much that out of her own money, she's doing this to help other people. So yes. I don't want people to lose sight of that and we've had other people do that in the past as well where they come up and say this has helped me so much i want to help somebody else and they and they've sometimes they've given anonymous anonymously sometimes they've asked for like a gift certificate they can give somebody else but you know it it just says a lot about somebody who says i just want to help other blended families and the best way for me to do that is just support you guys in in giving away these scholarships so yes you know big Big and this shout is out to her. The third or maybe fourth time she's done this. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Shout out to you, Sylvia. Yep. Yep. Talking All about right. pay talking about paying it forward. She's just she's doing it. So Yes. Need more Sylvia's in the world. <laughs> mm-hmm. Helping everybody. Well, and it makes me feel good because she believes in us. Yeah. And she knows that our heart is to help. Step families. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, before I get teary-eyed, let's talk about our guest today. All right. Our guest today is Tony Graham with My Blended Chaos. Sweet. She's been blending for five years. She has two stepsons. One is 12, one is 10. 
She has a bio son who is eight and an hour's daughter who is three. She is from Australia. Hmm. Yeah, but with those ages, you are slapped in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. She was a stepmom at 19. This is her second plan. She was a stepmom at 19, and the baby was four months old. Bio mom was out of the picture, and the child had disabilities. Mm-hmm. They were together about four years. Her next relationship is how bio son eight came about. And then her now husband, they have an hour's daughter three. Sounds like a good story. It is. One thing that we talk about is what's your priority in a blend? And a lot of people say your marriage has to be the priority. Your marriage, your marriage, your marriage. And sometimes I argue that because when someone says that to me, what I would hear would be, If David tells you Jackson has to go live with his dad or y'all have to leave, then, oh, your marriage is first. Jackson has to go live with his dad. No, sir. Mm -mm. But Tony says this perfectly. She says, your marriage is first, but not at the expense of your bio kids. Yep. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it a lot. I will say that this episode does have a little mention of domestic violence. She grew up in a blend, but it was more like a nuclear family. So again, different blends can be different and look different and smell different. (laughs) Smell different? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, if it looks like a duck, talks like a duck, smells like a duck, walks like a duck. I don't think it has smells like a duck, does it? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't think so. But. Also, her husband grew up in a blend, but it was a completely opposite blend than the one she grew up in. Mm, yeah. A lot of people have very different uh, experiences in the blend. And sometimes those experiences can cloud your judgment, and it's hard to understand why this blend isn't like the one before or like the one you grew up in. Mm-hmm. Or your next one. Mm-hmm. You weren't David. supposed to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I realize a lot of times when I edit these, you'll say something and I just keep going. I know. I just completely ignore you. <laughs> no, sometimes you say yes when you shouldn't say anything. I know, just like now. <laughs> anyway, so I really enjoyed having Tony as a guest. And she did say that she has learned a lot from us, David. Oh. Yeah. She learned how to not push buttons. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So that's all I got. All right. Let's get to listening. Today we have stepmom Tony with My Blended Chaos. Hey, Tony, how are you? Good. Thanks, Lori. How are you? Doing well. So tell us a little bit about you and your blend. How many stepkids, bio kids, hours kids, how long you've been blending? All right. So we're going on five years now of blending. We each brought kids into the relationship. So I have my son who I refer to on my blog page about as Big K. Big K. (laughs) Yeah. And he's just turned eight. And then my husband has two kids from his previous marriage, which is Big J, who is 12, Little J, who is 10. And then we have our daughter who's just turned three, and that's Miss K. Oh, how cute. You finally got a girl. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I love it. One girl amongst the chaos. Yes. And how long have you been blending? Going on five years now. Okay. And where are you located? You are not in the States, are you? No, I am from Brisbane, Australia, which is in Queensland. Okay. (laughs) We actually know quite a few people there. Nice. Yeah. Maybe we'll get to visit one day. Oh, that would be amazing. My husband and I have a five-year plan that we want to go to the States. Probably we want to do like Christmas in New York. Oh, yeah. Well, if you ever make it over this way, you'll have to let me know and maybe we can meet up. Absolutely. So you were in a relationship before and you had a son. Yeah, a son. and. You meet this guy and he's got two kids. Yeah. 
were you hesitant to get in a relationship with someone that had kids? It wasn't that I was hesitant to get in a relationship with someone who had kids. I was more hesitant to be in another relationship because the relationship with my son's father was so toxic. Mm. And this is actually my second time being a stepmom. So I was first a stepmom when I was 19. Oh, wow. It was, it was a completely different situation to what I'm in now. The At that time, the child um, was mentally disabled and the bio mom was out of the picture. So that situation was completely different to the situation I'm in now. So I wasn't very hesitant about him having kids. It was more getting into another relationship. Oh, I completely understand that. I think we were all hesitant to get into another one. Yeah. If um, you don't mind, can I ask you about have, being a stepmom to a disabled child? Yeah. I know that that definitely added some, we'll say stress to your blend, but you were 19. Yeah. So I was 19 and I started dating this guy who had a four month old baby at the time. Mm-hmm. Bio mom was in and out of the picture. And we, you know, within a year we were living together, we were running a business and I essentially took on the role of mum. And in that time, that's where we found out that he had this syndrome called West syndrome, which is basically severe adult epilepsy in an infant and part of his brain just never developed. Oh, So it was kind of hard. I took on that mum role at such a young age and bio mum split and, you know, it was his father and I, mostly me, taking him to all his therapies. We were trying to teach him sign language because they said that he was never going to learn to walk or talk or be able to do anything for himself, which is Far from the truth where he's at today. Thank goodness. Yeah. So he's learning to talk. He can sign and he can walk. He goes to school, which is amazing. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that you had a lot to do with that. I like to think so. And even his dad has said that to me that, you know, I was such a big part to get him to where he is now. Mm -hmm. So even though our relationship fell apart. (laughs) How how long were y'all together? That was four years. Okay. Now, is he the father of your? No, he's not the father of my son. So after that relationship ended, I quickly got into another relationship, which is (laughs) a red flag in itself. And within a year, I had fallen pregnant with Big K unexpectedly. Okay. And then that relationship obviously didn't last. No, we we were engaged, but I just, I couldn't make the commitment to actually marry him because the relationship was just toxic in itself. Yeah. So how far apart or how long were you single before you met your husband now? It is, is it your husband now? Yeah, he's my husband. Okay. So I actually knew him before we started dating. I... Sorry, sorry, I'm trying to figure out the best way to word this. So we knew each other. We actually worked together and we both separated around the same time. It was like a few months apart and I didn't know that he had separated from his wife. And coincidentally, our kid weekends fell on the same weekend and we ran into each other at a local playground. Mm -hmm. and. Then we got talking and it kind of just went from there. But I was probably, I still wasn't very single for very long. It was about four months that I was single for before we started dating. Goodness. Yeah. Kind of fast there, Tony. (laughs) I know. I know. I have some serious issues. It's funny though. It's so easy to think I'm not going to get in another relationship and then you meet somebody and you are before you know it. Yeah. It, I had no intentions of being in another relationship and it kind of, the pieces just fell together and we weren't seriously dating. We were just kind of hanging out, spending time together on our kid free weekends and it just developed from there. Right. And when you, y'all started dating How long did it, well, I guess you met the kids before that y'all even started dating, really. 
Yeah, we did. But when when we did start dating and we started doing things together, it was just, I would say to my son, oh, we're just going to go see mummy's friend who has some little boys that you can play with. And I remember my husband telling me that because Big K is on the bigger side and even though there's two years between him and little J, they're the same size and Big K was only three at the time and he he told his sons, he goes, okay, so we're going to have a friend come over and there's a baby but he's the same size as little J so you need to be careful with him <laughs> <laughs> because he's still a baby. So we do just a couple of play dates here and there so that the kids got to know us better and it was actually them who kept asking for a sleepover. Oh. So the kids kind of, my now husband kept asking me to move in with him and I kept saying, no, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to live with you. We were spending our kid weekends apart until the kids got to know each other better and then they kept asking, his his two boys kept asking if I could have a sleepover with Big K and it kind of went from there and we started spending more and more kid weekends together. And you said, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, pretty pretty much. Well, the first time they asked, we said, oh, maybe not this time, but maybe next time you come over, we'll organize a sleepover, which they were so excited about. They even went back and told their mum that <laughs> dad's friend was sleeping over with her son. Oh, my goodness. How did that go over? He got a few nasty text messages and oh, yeah. he just said, she's just a friend the boys really like her son. They've asked for him to have a sleepover. But she, she's had the delusion that we were having an affair the whole time before they separated, and so does my ex. He has the same delusion. Um, uh, of course. It, it makes them feel better about themselves to think that it's you and your husband that we're doing something wrong. Absolutely. And the funny thing is, is that The stories that my husband's told me, he was sleeping on a couch for over a year before he decided to finally leave. He was stuck on that he had to stay in the crappy situation for the boys. Yeah. And he'd been sleeping on a couch and just going through the motions, thinking that he was doing right by his kids. And then he said to me, it was because I'd asked for time off so that I could move. And when he found out that I had separated and I was going to go do it out on my own he said it was you who inspired me because you know you could do it on your own he's like well why can't I do the same thing why do I have to live in a crappy situation right right and I want to say this for all our listeners if you are in a marriage or relationship that you are unhappy first of all before you throw in the towel seek marriage counseling or couples therapy, unless there's abuse and all that stuff. Absolutely. But even if you try to reach out for marriage counseling and the other person isn't going to do it, then that's right. your red flag right there. Right. You can't save the relationship yourself. Absolutely. But secondly, if you've tried marriage counseling and it doesn't work, your kids need to see you in a happy, healthy relationship. It's not for their best interest that you stay in a crappy relationship because then they're going to end up in crappy relationships. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my parents didn't have the best relationship. I didn't have the best role models growing up. And I say that all the time. I chose crappy men for so long because of the role model that I had. Right. And that sticks a knife in my dad's guts, but he gets it. He realized that he wasn't showing me how a man should treat a woman growing up. Right. And I agree with you. My parents, they talked about getting divorced from as far back as I could remember. It was always every other Friday when my mom got paid because Mm -hmm. apparently she wasn't very good with money and my dad expected her to pay her car payment and she never had enough. It was just, that's when they would fight. Yeah. And they were miserable, miserable. Yeah. And now I'm a daddy's girl. So it was easy for me to say, oh, well, mama's the bad one. But as an adult, I see that my mom 
was the main caregiver for three kids. She worked full time, took care of the house, cooked supper, did the laundry. She did everything. Yeah. And they weren't very loving toward each other. And so I think that's one reason that I maybe picked the not so good people sometimes too. Yeah. Because that's what you knew. Absolutely. And my husband and I are really big on that where we will, and I see the comments on Instagram all the time going, you need to put your bio kids before your new relationship. In some circumstances, yes, you need to. But my husband and I are very big on, we put our relationship first, but not at the expense of our children. That is the perfect way to phrase that. Because I've had discussions with people and they'll say, oh, my marriage comes first. And I, you know, kind of shake my head and I think, no, I love David. But if if David said I had to let my son go live with his dad or I had to go, I would say hasta la pasta, baby. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I get that. Absolutely. But ugh, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it. I, I know what you're saying. Your marriage yeah. is important. You work together as a team. It may not be as a team parenting the kids. It just depends on what works for you. But your kid, you have a responsibility to. Yes. Yes, that is it. But I'm not going to not prioritize my marriage because at the end of the day, the kids are going to grow up. They're going to move out. And at the end of the day, I'm only going to have my husband. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm not going to pick him over my children if it's at the expense of my children. Right. Like your kids may say, I don't like him. And a lot of parents will say, okay, then I can't be in this relationship. No, you're giving the kid too much power. It's different if they are mean to your kid. If they are mean to your kid, neglectful, abusive, whatever, that's a different story. But if they just don't like the fact that the step parent is telling them to pick their shoes up, And that's why they don't like them. No, you know, you can't give them that much power. You just can't. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you get it because so many people try and argue with me about it. And I try to explain that it's not at the expense of my child, but I'm not having my child dictate my relationship. Right. And that's a good way to put it at not the expense of your child. Mm -hmm. So how how did the kids get? Well, I guess they got along great at first. Do they still get along well? They do. The boys, they were calling each other brothers even before we lived together. Oh. They they are thick as thieves. And when Miss K came along, you know, we had a few roller coaster moments there about, you know, she's not my sister and the confusion because the boys were still young. But now, you know, she she's their little princess who can do no wrong, mm-hmm. which is absolutely not the truth. She beats the living hell out of all of them and they (laughs) take it. She's going to be a tough girl. Oh, absolutely. The youngest with three older brothers and I can't imagine she'll ever be allowed to date in their their eyes. Right. Yeah. They're very protective of her. So That's sweet though. I love that they were calling each other brothers before y'all even got married. Yeah. Yeah, we weren't married, we weren't living together, and they were brothers. And I remember my husband's ex-wife called him once and said, you know, little Jay is just so obsessed with Big K and said he can't wait to go back to your house because he wants to see Big K. Oh, how does she handle all that? We've had some rocky moments. At first, she was really glad that the boys had a good relationship with me and a good relationship with my son. You know, there wasn't any animosity, I guess. Mm -hmm. But then after I fell pregnant, that's when she called my husband abusing him, saying things like, how dare you have another child, that she will never be their sister, you know, all that toxic tongues type of stuff which then spilled down into little J, which has caused a few issues there and that's when at first he was excited about having a little sister and then he went back to his mum's for a week and then came home 
to us and went, oh, that baby's not my sister because she's not coming out of my mum's belly. Ah. So, you know, when that happened, she, there was a bit more of a roller coaster with that and she was good once. The boy's mother was good once Miss K was here and then we then we went to court for child custody, which then she spiralled and said that she didn't acknowledge Miss K or Big K as the boy's siblings. But I think since then she's kind of gotten over it and now they're one big happy family basically. She accepts the kids as the boy's siblings. Good. So I think it was just a bit of a roller coaster moment, I guess, with the emotions going through court. So before you went to court, how often did you have the stepkids? So prior to Miss K being born, we had the kids Friday, Saturday, and half of all school holidays, which is six weeks over a calendar year. Mm -hmm. So you had little K. Is yes. that when y'all decided to try to get more custody of the kids? Yeah, because COVID hit and we made the decision that with a newborn baby, it wasn't wise for me to go back to work because we didn't know what that was going to look like. Well, no one knew what anything was going to look like when COVID hit. So yeah. we decided I wouldn't go back to work and we we had this epiphany. Well, if I'm not going back to work, then he can have the boys more because we live an hour apart from the boy's mother. Mm -hmm. So previously with both of us working, it made it really hard to do the school run essentially and have them on those days. Right. So you go to court. I'm not sure what the family court system is like over there, but the people that I have talked to, it's like it is everywhere else. It's messed up. It well is pretty messed up. We... So we didn't have to go to court straight away. They had a private arrangement. My husband and his ex-wife, he contacted her and said, our situation's changed. I'd really like to have more time with the boys. And, you know, previously we live, so we actually live an hour apart from them. So it was really difficult to be able to do the school run. Mm -hmm. And obviously with me not returning to work, that made it really easy because it meant that I could, do that for him so that he could spend more time with his kids. Right. So they had the private agreement that they would trial for six months, five nights a fortnight, so Friday to Wednesday, and then after six months it would go to 50-50 custody week on, week off. Okay. But at the end of the six months she refused and because she didn't like that I was even more involved in the kid's life. Yeah. So she refused and wanted to go back to every second weekend. And that's where my husband went to mediation. So here in Australia, you have to participate in mediation before you can go to court. Mm -hmm. And you have to get what's called a 60I certificate. Okay. Without that certificate, you can't attend court basically. And he went to mediation. She agreed to go to mediation, but then just sat there with her arms crossed and went, no, you're not seeing the kids, you know, over yeah. my dead body. She, and she said to him, I'd rather you not have them at all. Okay. And so he said, well, I guess we're off to court. And we went to court and we fought for a year. Goodness. It didn't go to trial. They were able to negotiate an agreement which was that it stayed five nights a fortnight for two years and then from January 1, 2024, it would then be 50-50 custody. Okay. And my husband had to give her the school of her choice because she was moving and moving the boys' schools and we thought perfect opportunity to put them into a school halfway between both our homes. Right. To shorten that drive for everyone, it also would have bettered our situation because I could have gone back to work. But no, she wouldn't agree to that. She wanted the school that was four minutes from her house rather than one that was 20 minutes from her house. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, my husband went, you know what? Having the boys half the time is better than 
having like having to keep fighting on the school. Right. So he decided to um, sign off on the consent orders. Mm -hmm. So in Australia, we've got through mediation, you can get a parenting plan. Um, If it goes to court and you agree before a trial, it's what is called consent orders. Right. And you can turn a parenting plan into consent orders as well. But if it goes to trial, then it's court ordered. That's the difference between the consent orders and the court ordered. So Mm -hmm. if it goes to trial, that's basically where the judge makes the decisions for you. Right. But the consent orders, they're signed off by a judge, right? Yes. So that's the difference between the parenting plan and consent orders. So it's still signed off by a judge and it's legally enforceable. That's why there's the option. So in my case, I don't have consent orders for Big K. I only have a parenting plan. So if the wheels fall off, I can take that parenting plan and apply to the courts to have it turned into consent orders so then they are legally enforceable. Okay. So she decided to pick the school that was closest to her, of course. Yeah. So when you take the kids to school and back, that's two hours? Yes. Wow. So you spend four hours a day driving back and forth. Sometimes I, I'm glad that, you know, Miss Kay's not in school at the moment. So we have a lot of free time. Obviously, it doesn't free up time for me to be able to get a job during school hours or anything like that. So I tend to find activities to do during the day with her that are close to the boys' school so that I don't have to spend four hours a day in the car. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, when she was still really little, I was doing the drive twice a day because it was COVID, everywhere was locked down, so Mm -hmm. I couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, And that was probably harder because she was still the first year of her life and she was on-demand breastfeeding and trying to do a four-hour drive a day with with a baby like that was difficult. It's probably easier now that she's older and we can go do stuff. Um, Right. But, yeah, if... If I don't find something to do down the coast where the kids go to school, then, yeah, it looks like a four-hour drive in the car for me that day. You are one heck of a stepmom to spend two hours in a car transporting the stepkids to and from school, much less four hours. Thanks, Laurie. But in reality, I do it because I know that... I do it for my husband, essentially. Yes. I love the boys. I do. I love the boys. But I do it because Mm -hmm. I know him having a meaningful relationship with the boys is important. And because of his work, and he also has to drive an hour in the opposite direction of their school to go to work. So, you know, it's very unrealistic for him to be able to get them to and from school. So I do it not only because I love the boys, but I do it for my husband, because I know it's important for him to have a meaningful relationship with the boys. Yes. And so much of what we do as step parents, we have to realize that we are doing it for our partners, our significant others, not necessarily the stepkids. Yes. Yeah. So you said that your, your biological son, there's no parenting plan. There's no court orders or consent orders. There's just a signed parenting plan. Okay. So that's just his father and I attended mediation and we agreed on what custody arrangements would look like and we've signed off on it. So if for whatever reason one of us aren't following it, either of us could apply to the court to have it changed into consent orders. Okay. Uh, But it's more we just use it as a guide of this is when each person spending time with Big K or Mm -hmm. what I prefer to say is when Big K gets to spend time with the other parent and we try to stick to it and it's a good fallback when, you know, there's always drama around Mother's Day and Father's Day. For example, Mother's Day always falls on the weekend. Big K is meant to be with his dad and it's always an argument. But then we refer back to the parenting plan where it says, Big K gets to spend Mother's Day with his biological mother. Right. The same. Only makes sense. Well, it does. And, 
you know, every year Father's Day falls on his weekend, so he doesn't ever have to miss out on Father's Day. But there's been quite a few arguments in the past and I've always offered going, let him spend Mother's Day with me and you can have the following weekend and have two weekends in a row as a makeup. Mm -hmm. But he is a very argumentative person and didn't like that. So that's why I had to get it put into the parenting plan to go, well, hey, this is what you've agreed upon. And if we're not going to keep following this, then we have to get consent orders and then we have to get lawyers involved. And he doesn't want to do that. He wants to keep it as least amount of complicated as possible. Right. So that's where it's been good for us because it hasn't cost us anything to have to agree on that custody schedule. And if he turned around to me tomorrow, even though our relationship was crappy, if he turned around to me tomorrow and said, you know what, I want to have big K 50% of the time, I'll say, good, good, please, please spend that time with your son. And, you know, I wouldn't fight him on it because I know that I've seen what my husband's gone through and he's had to fight to have that relationship with his sons. And I just, I can't imagine doing that to my son because it's more damaging to the child. How often does your ex see BK now? They have a Friday night to Sunday night schedule. So he picks up from school on a Friday, drops him back to school on a Monday morning. And there's a one one night, a fortnight on the opposite week. They do dinner together and he has him for half the school holidays. Okay. Is BK's relationship with his dad pretty good? It's better now than what it was. Big K's done a lot of therapy on his half. His dad never attended therapy with him, but he's done a lot of work to realize that what he gets from his dad is probably all he's going to get. And he's come to accept that because he always, he sees the relationship that his stepfather has with his older brothers. Mm -hmm. And he always wanted that from his dad. And wasn't getting it. Yeah. So he he's come to terms and just gone, that's just how my dad is and I'll just cherish the times that I get to spend with him. And it's much better than what it was 12 months ago. 12 months ago he'd asked me to stop seeing him. Really? And, he, yeah, they, so I don't mind if you put this in here or not okay. or if you cut it, but there's a history of domestic violence between Big K's father and I. Okay. So he had to witness from a very young age the violence and that's why I've had him in therapy from as soon as a therapist would accept him, I've had him in therapy and he he's had to do a lot of work to realise that, you know, the way he treated his, his dad treated me isn't the same way his dad treated him. Right. But he he holds on to that and last year there was a we I got flooded in to the area that I live in so there was another cyclone there was flooding and I got trapped in the in the suburb that I live in and he had big K with him for that weekend and I had tried calling him and I said hey look we're flooding in you either need to keep him or you need to bring him home now Right. And he didn't believe me, so he waited until the scheduled drop-off time, which at the time it was he was only having him Friday, Saturday, bringing him home by 7 p.m. on a Sunday. And he didn't believe me, so at 7 p.m. at night he started calling me and abusing me over the phone while Big K was in the car. And he was abusing me because he couldn't get back to me without driving through floodwaters. And Big K had to witness that. And essentially he just had this fear and he just didn't want to be around his father when he was angry because he was triggered by that anger. And, you know, when he was terrified, he he started wetting the bed and he was saying, Mum, I am not going back to Dad's. And I said, well... I'll make a deal with you. You go back to therapy. I'm not going to make you go for a couple of weeks until you've seen your therapist and you work through it and you're comfortable to go back to your dad's. Right. Because 
I get it. He was scared. He was scared. His father was verbally abusing me over the phone. Right. And he had to witness that, which isn't good for any child. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, that's not a reason to withhold custody, but it was, he, he needed to work through some stuff and realize that, okay, yes, his dad shouldn't have done that, but his dad still does love him. His dad just has a serious problem with anger and especially his anger towards me. And even when we, we had to go back through mediation and they said to me, they're like, why are you withholding? You know, he hasn't physically harmed his son. I said, well, he mentally has because his son started wetting the bed and screaming and crying and he's terrified to go back to his father's because he just doesn't want to hear him talking crap about me, right. basically. And it was probably about two and a half months that he didn't see his dad for. They had phone contact in that time. They would FaceTime call once a week, but they didn't have any visitation until Big K had done several therapy sessions and he asked the therapist to reach out to his father to ask if he could go there for the weekend, which was a big step. Yes, that is a huge step. And that was the whole point of me putting him back into therapy was I wanted him to feel better about going to his dad's to realize that just one, one instance of his father behaving badly doesn't depict him. Right. Exactly. Um, so since, since then, it's been 12 months since the parenting, since all that happened and the parenting plan changed and he's had a really good relationship with his father since. So it's definitely improving. Yes. I'm glad that you have him in therapy. I love therapy for kids. I wish my parents put me in therapy as a kid because I grew up in a blended family. And even my husband, he grew up in a blended family as well. And he said, I wish my parents did more to help me process everything. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And there's the company that we did mediation through. They actually offer specific therapy, which is just targeted and aimed at supporting children after separation which is really good. And all three of the boys have done that program twice now. That is really good. So it just, it just focus, focuses on those feelings of transitioning between the homes and what they like in each home and what they don't like and making them realise, especially little Jay, because he is autistic so he really struggles with well dad and Tony make me eat my vegetables but mum will feed me McDonald's and then he sees the fact that we do home-cooked meals as a reason why he shouldn't come here so the therapy really helped him realize that just because we feed him different foods Mm -hmm. whether he likes those foods or not isn't a reason to not come here right when y'all got married Did you come in parenting the stepkids and did your husband start parenting your son? So I, I didn't start parenting the kids until they were with us five nights a fortnight because there was no real need for it. My husband was always here on the weekends that we had them. So he did a lot of their parenting then and he, I would say, yes, he did do a lot of parenting when it came to my son, mm-hmm. but his his dad was only seeing him two nights a fortnight then as well. So right. the dynamic, there was a different dynamic then to what it is now, whereas now that we have the kids five nights a fortnight, I do a lot more of the parenting, although with little Jay, I've had to take a massive step back and I've taken so many of your tips that you've given me on just how to take a step back because especially with he he's been subjected to parental alienation. Well both boys have but his autism impacts him differently to the way Big Jay's impacted. Mm-hmm. So Big Jay just goes, yeah mum's mum's an idiot. Like why <laughs> is she doing this? He just ignores her but Lil J with the autism, he takes everything literally. Mm-hmm. So whatever his mum says is golden. Her words are golden. Yeah. And it's been a lot harder. So he no longer views me as a parent. Okay. I'm just 
little J, I've had to take a big step back being subjected to the uh, parental alienation and emotional parentification. He no longer views me as a parent. I am just big K's mum, Miss K's mum and dad's wife to him now. Mm -hmm. And we have good days and bad days. There's good days where he will come to me and he wants me to do mum-like things for him. But it's been a rough six months where I've had to take a big step back and it's it's difficult when my husband's working and I am spending more time with the kids than while he's at work. Mm -hmm. But it's just... Whereas Big J welcomes it. He he told his whole football team last year that I'm his other mum because he'd rather people think that he has two mums than a stepmom because he just has, he sees stepmom as like that negative term. And I think that's because that's how the parental alienation has impacted him. Right. He's been told to view me, his stepmom, in an evil manner, but he doesn't see me that way. So he doesn't want to call me his stepmom anymore. Mm -hmm. So he just tells people that I'm his other mum because he doesn't see me as the wicked stepmother. Right. Whereas with little Jay, he's just, he's very lost and confused right now. And we, we've got him back in therapy and we're trying to help him through it. But since taking a massive step back, you know, I got my first kiss and cuddle in six months on the weekend where he said, can you come tuck me in and read me a book? Oh. And which is a big step. You know, he used to always have me read to him every night. And the last six months have been torture. And I just, I had to take that step back. And slowly but surely he's realising that we can still have a good relationship and that I'm not, trying to replace his mum because I have no interest in replacing their mum. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just in the dynamic of our household where my husband's working and I'm the one at home, I do do a lot more of the parenting for most of the children. Yeah. And with him, since you have had to step back, do you kind of do more like a babysitter role when it is just you and him? Yeah, so I have. It's more I take him to and from school. I only help him with homework if he asks me to. Mm -hmm. He's Even his father has backed me up on this one. If he doesn't want to eat the food that I cook, then he has to make his own dinner. And he can do simple things like make packet mac and cheese or two-minute noodles or make himself a sandwich or toast or something like that. Mm -hmm. And since, since then he's actually chosen to eat what I've cooked he no longer views my food as bad because he knows he has another option, but he doesn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And with his ADHD and his autism, he does have violent outbursts. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the only time I do any disciplining is if my husband's not here and he has one of those outbursts and I actually need to parent him in that moment to protect the other kids. Right. But. But if there's minor things that don't that can wait for my husband to get home, then I wait for my husband to get home to do the disciplining for those things. Yes, because there are some things that can be handled later. Yeah, absolutely. There's heaps of things like, I don't know, if the kids aren't putting their school bags away properly or they're leaving their shoes in the hallway rather than putting them on the shoe rack. Mm -hmm. And you taught me that tip. You taught me that tip because it was about the bedroom and the bedroom was driving me mental. And I just uh -huh. close the door now and I say to my husband, can you please get the boys to clean their room or can you please get the boys to put their bags away or pick up their shoes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they were the little things because especially Big J and Little J, their mum does everything for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas I am very big on teaching children to be independent so right. I'm not going to wash your dishes. I'm not going to put your shoes away. I may fold your clothes, but you can pick them up and you can put them away. Right. Whereas when they're in their other home, everything is done for them. They just live there but don't have to do anything. 
And that was a real frustrating thing for me. But the more I just ignore it, not ignore it, but don't react and then bring it up with my husband and have him deal with it, that has been a saving grace for us. Yes, because you can't control what happens at Bio Mom's house. No. And I mean, the kids are thinking at Bio Mom's house, they've got it made. Absolutely. And it's the same thing for Big K. When he goes to his dad's house, it's exactly the same. He doesn't have to do anything. Yeah. The difference is when he comes home, I can discipline him and I can pull him up on it straight away because I am his mother and he does have to listen to me and he does have to respect me and respect the house rules. Whereas if I'm constantly berating my stepsons about following the house rules, they just roll their eyes at me. They don't care. But if they hear it from their father, then they're going to listen. Exactly. And it's not, how do I say this? It's not so much as they're being disrespectful and rude to you. It's you're not their parent. That's it. And I know I was raised back in the day where you did what an adult told you to. Yes, so was I. But nowadays, it's not like that. And so if you were my stepmom and I came home and you said, pick your shoes up, I'd think, make me. (laughs) Yeah. You know, who are you to say that to me, lady? Yeah. And I guess... A big learning curve for me was going into this. The first time being a stepmom, there was no bio mom in the picture. Mm-hmm. Now this time, second ra- time around, there is a bio mom in the picture, and I was trying to. Part of it was I was trying to, especially when we got more custody, I was trying to force my blended family to work the way the blended family I grew up in worked. Mm-hmm. You know, we grew up where with. So both my parents are still together, but my older brother and sister are from my dad's first marriage, Okay, but were raised by my mum. Okay. So they called my mum, mum. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a very good relationship with their mum when they were younger and they didn't see her very often. I remember when I was four or five and I turned around to my parents and said, why don't I get to go visit with auntie? And that's when they had to sit down and explain to me that she's not actually my auntie and she's my brother and sister's mum. Yeah. And, you know, so for me, growing up in a blended family, our blended family worked like a nuclear family. Yes. And so I, I don't know, I had to restructure my way of thinking because just because I grew up in a blended family that functioned like a nuclear family doesn't mean my blended family has to function like a nuclear family, and that's okay. Right. Yes, it's definitely okay. And it's rare that blended families do function like nuclear families. It is. It's very rare. And I guess I just didn't realize growing up just how rare it was, especially now when I hear stories of my husband's blended family that he grew up in. And... We grew up complete. We both grew up in blended families, but completely different. What was his like? He had so the way he explains it to me, he had the wicked stepmother, Mm -hmm. but he also had the high conflict bio mum that he was forced to live with. Ah, so he he was kept from his dad as much as possible. So he'd go there for weekends. He doesn't remember celebrating Christmas with his dad, stepmom, stepsister, or his half brother. Okay. So he he's got a full biological brother that with his dad and his mom, mm-hmm. but he doesn't remember spending like a, a single Christmas as a child with his dad's side. That's sad. So he it is sad, and he doesn't have a great relationship with his stepmother. Um, to him, she she is the typical wicked stepmother. Mm-hmm. And even now, he he tells me things about his relationship with his mum and how he was basically he was forced to live with her, and because he wasn't given the option. But then he also didn't feel welcome at his dad's house because of his stepmom. So he he didn't really have 
he didn't feel like he belonged in either home because he felt like his mum was basically trying to keep him just to punish his dad. Right. That's and horrible. That's, it is. It's horrible. And that's why he says all the time to the boys, if you decide you don't want to be here, I'm not going to make you come here because I don't want you to feel like you have to be here. Right. And, you know, there's going to be people who disagree with telling the kids that, but we want our kids to be happy. We want to give them some autonomy over themselves and to make their choices. And especially as Big J gets older, he's in high school now, so he's going to start making more and more decisions for himself. And that probably one of them is going to be if he wants to come here less or if he wants to come here more. Right. And we just keep telling the boys that, when you're old enough to start making these decisions, whether we agree with them or not, we're going to support you on it because we don't want to feel like you're a pawn, like your life is not a chess game. Right, exactly. But it sounds like you and your husband grew up in completely opposite blends. We did, and that's where we're basically taking what we like and what we don't like from our blends to try and figure out what, works for us because we're five years in, but we're still figuring out what works. Oh, honey, we're 13 years in and I don't think you ever stop figuring out what works because different things come up. One of the kids gets out of the Air Force. They need to come back here for a little bit. Grandbabies come into the pictures. You're always trying to figure out how to make it work and what works best for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's not easy, but I think once you get to a point that, like with me, I don't dwell on things like I did before I started not showing. Yeah. And that helps me because I can take something for what it is and then move on. Yeah. I know we need to wrap up, but I do want to talk about what you do and your podcast, Blended Chaos, and what other stuff do you have? So I've got my personal blog on Instagram, which is My Blended Chaos, which you just recently encouraged me to join TikTok as well, which my handle is the same. And I've just started a podcast with my friend Lauren, which is called Raising His Kids. Okay, great. So, yeah. We'll have to check that out. Yeah. So please listen. We'd love to have you as a guest one time. We were talking just the other day. Because I told Lauren that I was coming on here and she said how she'd been on your podcast and that we should have you as a guest sometime once we start having guests. Yes, definitely. Just let me know. Yeah, awesome. Well, what made you want to start something like My Blended Chaos? Is it just a blog, do like coaching or anything like that to help stepmoms or stepdads? I'm not a qualified coach. I have looked into doing it. Mm -hmm. but I haven't made any steps to actually go that far yet. I started it basically because I was struggling. I couldn't find anything on Instagram or anywhere of any other people in blends like mine, especially at the time we were dealing with two high conflict parents on either side. Right. And I hadn't quite found anyone who had a yours, mine, ours dynamic that could offer any advice. So I basically started it to share my story and the things that my family have been through and what I've been through just to help other people know that they're not alone. Yes. Um, so I've I've made friends from all across the world and there's bio mums, there's step mums, and I just, I like sharing my story. I'm a big oversharer and... <laughs> I I like to share my story to help others and I offer advice based on things that I know and through my experience, basically. Yes. And that's great. We all need to know that we are not alone. Yeah. And your situation is a little unique. We actually have dealt with a lot of people that have the his, hers, and ours, but dealing with the high conflict both exes. That is a little unique. Usually you just have one that's crazy, not both. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes we get really lulled into a false sense of security where neither of them are being 
aggressive or having any conflict at the time and we kind of always waiting we're walking on eggshells waiting for the other shoe to drop Mm -hmm. because it's only a matter of time before something blows up and one of them flip out at us about something and we just I don't know the best way my husband's found to handle his ex is to just give her whatever she wants uh. You know, she she's just asked <laughs> to take the boys overseas for three weeks and he went, you know what, I'm not going to argue with you. Sure, you deal with it, but you deal with the school. And when I ask you for the 12 days makeup time, you have to give it to me because it's taking out 12 days of the time that the boys would have been with us. Right. But he just didn't see the point in arguing about it, that it was three weeks and she's pulling them out of school to do it. He just... He went, you know what, it's a great experience for the boys and then she actually owes me and most recently my my ex no longer speaks to me. I have to deal with not only him being high conflict but I have to deal with his fiancé being high conflict as well. So does he make you deal with her? So there was a point in time where I him and I could not see eye to eye. We were arguing all the time. I reached out to her thinking as a mother, because our sons are brothers, I thought maybe she could be more reasonable and perhaps I could reach out to her. Maybe she might be willing to help navigate the co-parenting relationship to be able to work things out. And that's when I learned she was probably worse than him She told me that our sons would never be brothers. They share half of their blood and no more of that. And I was just mind blown at that comment. It absolutely shocked me because I'm very big on whether you're step or half or what, you're still siblings. Right. And she was very big on they will never be brothers. I was like, and that that threw me for a six and I just realised that I could never get along with this woman and sh- there's been times where she started sending me abusive emails, sending me abusive messages on Facebook. Oh. She went as far as contacting my husband's ex-wife and her new husband to talk about my blog that I have on Instagram. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so she she is the high conflict stepmom. So did you think about taking it down? I did. I I removed all my followers. I tried to deactivate it, but Instagram wouldn't let me. I don't know why. I guess it was glitching that time. And so I what I did was I switched it to private and I removed all my followers because I was freaking out. I just when my husband got that text message from his ex-wife going, what the hell is this? Mm-hmm. I I just went, I don't need this drama in my life. I created it as an outlet for myself and to, to help others and there's people in my life who are trying to destroy that and they weren't just trying to destroy me. They inadvertently were trying to hurt my husband and my husband's kids by damaging the co-parenting relationship that my husband has with his ex-wife. Right. But then I had what my husband likes to call, now we're not religious people, but my husband likes to call it a come to Jesus meeting, which is where I put my big girl pants on and I contacted the boy's mother and I spoke to her about it. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, she said, you've, you said some pretty hurtful things. I said, yeah, I did. I probably shared a bit too much. I probably shouldn't have put everything out there that I did. But the fact is, is that I did it and I can't take it back. And I want you to know, I said it from a place of frustration. But one thing that I won't apologize for is that I didn't tell any lies. I told the truth. Right. And she seemed to accept that. And we've kind of moved on from there. Right. And after after we spoke about that, I've just been a bit more careful about when I do post things, you know, not rather than just saying, 
high conflict buyer mom or whatever I'll, or high conflict buyer dad, I just say co-parent or things like that when I talk about things that have happened. So you can't really pinpoint which co-parent it was. Right. Unless I talk about which child it was. But so I try and curb what I write about in a sense to make it harder to know which of the co-parents I'm talking about. And, but that's one thing that I have always stuck by. I've never told a lie. I only tell the truth. And I guess that's where she wasn't angry. Yeah. She she was annoyed that I put the things out there, but I didn't tell any lies. Right. Like I only, I only spoke the truth and I guess that's why she wasn't angry. But since we had that talk, things between her and I have actually been pretty good. And that's, it was after that, that I decided, well, she's actually okay with it. She knows the page exists. She doesn't really care. So I, I set it all back up again and started posting. Well, I'm glad you did. And I'm glad that they didn't deter you from continuing to do this because step families need help. They need all the help they can get. They do. They do. And I don't think there can ever be too many resources. Absolutely not. Like I'm still learning every single day. And I, I learned from you and David when I take, tips from you with your posts or when you and I message Mm -hmm. and you know there's there's heaps of other pages out there and I just I love connecting with more and more people because we can bounce ideas off each other and help each other through every stage of our step families exactly well Tony thank you so much for being a guest and sharing your story and for creating blended chaos so you can help other people And thanks for having me, Laurie. I feel like this has been a really long time coming. Yes, and we will definitely stay in touch and we'll have you back soon. Absolutely, and hopefully I can have you on Raising His Kids soon. Yes, that'd be great. All right, thank you. One thing that Tony and I talk about is how when Bio Mom found out that Tony was pregnant, she was not very happy and texted Tony's husband and said, how dare you have another kid? Hmm. Okay. (laughs) How dare you? That's interesting. Well, a lot of times what happens is the bio mom thinks, oh, great, the ex is having another baby. He's not going to pay as much attention to this baby. They're going to be the nuclear family and leave out the first kid, Hmm. which can happen. Yeah. But to say, how dare you have another kid? Huh. (laughs) All right, David, so what else we got going on? Mm, I don't know. It's always something. Always something? Well, I do want to say that we have a dear friend, Claudette Chenevere. She is the stepmom coach. And Claudette's husband, Bernard, has recently had to have surgery to remove his voice box. And he is kicking butt, y'all. He is kicking butt. Mm-hmm. What, the day after the surgery? He, I mean, he's smiling. He's looking good. He's up and walking the next day. He's all this stuff. I mean, he has just kicked butt. hmm But if you would like to send a card of support to Bernard and Claudette, shoot me an email, and I will shoot you their address. It's a lot of shooting going on. I know you told me I had to quit saying that word. (laughs) Send me an email and I will reply and send you their address so you can send him a card of encouragement. Sounds good. Count me in. And they like stickers, so you could send them some stickers. (laughs) I think I got a bunch of stickers around here I can send. I might even have a coloring book. (laughs) (laughs) You going to send him a coloring book? Yeah. (laughs) All right. David's going to send Bernard a coloring book with some crayons. Yep, and stickers, like the sticker and color book. You ever seen them, like the sticker books? I had sticker books growing up. Now, it might I remember be a, my sticker book. I loved my sticker book. Now, I don't know what happened to it. Bernard, if you're listening, it might be like Dora the Explorer, but, but I'll send you some. <laughs> <laughs> he can't listen to us right now because he can't fuss back at us. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. yet, anyway, yeah. but he will. I'm really impressed with his recovery, Yeah, and we just... Pray that he continues to have a great recovery, and we look forward to hearing his new voice when he gets 
to that point. Yep. He's probably got a Barry White voice. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be funny, won't it? Yeah. All right, folks. I think that's all we got for now. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for listening and join us again next week. And remember, life is good. When you nacho. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.